Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today's video is all about table manners. We provide you with the ultimate guide on a basic dining etiquette so you don't embarrass yourself and get ahead in life. This is part one in an ongoing series about etiquette, so please check out the other videos in our playlist. Table manners are probably something your parents taught you, but are actually far more important as an adult. First of all, your table manners speak volumes about your refinement and it's often interpreted as a sign of character. It's not at all about being snobby or showing off, but much rather to show respect. Your host and your dining partners will greatly appreciate your manners. Good table manners are a proof of your social skills and because of that, they're often part of an interview process for higher end positions or people where you have a lot of client contact. Just the other day, I talked to an entrepreneur and he only hires people after he had lunch, dinner, and a drink with him because he wants to see how they react in different situations and without proper manners, he won't get the job, that's for sure. Tell manners also help you so you don't embarrass yourself or otherwise draw any kind of negative attention to you. Last but not least, tail manners make other people feel comfortable in your presence and therefore help to keep up the flow of conversation and entertainment, which is the main part of dining together with other people. It's very important to keep in mind, proper table manners will always help you and never hurt you. The good thing is they can be learned and it's never too late to do so. So what are table manners? Basically, they're the actions and the behavior at the dining table. In this day and age, you'll encounter a lot of informal dining situations, but that never means that table manners are not required or appropriate. For example, a barbecue should never be an excuse to chew with your mouth open and make noises like a pig. After all, we're all civilized people. The rules, do's and don'ts we discuss in this video today apply to every basic dining situation out there that involves silverware. For more in-depth situations about very formal dinners with multiple courses, lots of different silver and glassware, stay tuned for another video. Also, before you can sit down at the dining table, usually there's an invitation, there's an RSVP, there's a gift, and we cover all of the before and after dinner etiquette rules in a different video. Let's focus on what happens when you sit down at the table. I suggest to turn your cell phone ringer off when you enter someone else's home and put your phone in your pocket when you're with guests or if you're hosted. Don't leave your phone on the table because you're much more likely to pick it up and look at it, which is impolite in the presence of other people. If the table is all set, you don't just walk in and sit down. Instead, wait for a cue of the host or if they sit, you can sit as well. Ideally, you wanna sit up straight but comfortably. Don't slouch, cross your arms, or sit like you would on your couch at home while watching a football game. Don't expect to sit next to your partner and follow the lead of the host. Traditionally, couples were always mixed up to sit with different people, oftentimes man, woman, man, woman, just so you would create an interesting way to stimulate conversation. If there's a napkin on the plate or next to a plate, put it on your lap right away. If the host or hostess wants to say grace, accept the gesture for what it is and move along. At the same time, do not offer to say grace yourself because people may not be religious at all. Two, let's take a look at a place setting. In the Western world, an informal place setting will always have at least a plate, a knife, and a fork. If dessert will be served, you'll find either a little fork or a spoon on the top side of the plate. If soup is served or anything else that requires a spoon, you will also have a spoon. At more formal dinners, place settings can be a lot more elaborate with several sets of silverware and the general rule of thumb is to always work your way from the outside in, but we'll talk much more about that in our formal dining guide video. Take a look here. On the top right side of the plate, you'll likely find a water glass, which is always filled, and a wine glass, which is empty to begin with. Sometimes you'll also find beer glasses, if you prefer that, or if that's what's served with a meal. If you see a little plate with an extra knife on the top left of your plate, that's for bread and butter. Again, silver is arranged from the outside in. So if you see two forks and two knives, that means you start with the outermost fork and the outermost knife. That's usually for the appetizer or the starter course. When you're done with the course, you place the fork and the knife at a four to five o'clock angle, that means you're done. If you're not done yet, you can have it in this position or in that position that indicates that you're not finished eating yet. 
Do not put the used silverware back on the tablecloth or the table and simply put it on the plate so it can be taken away. Trust me, your host thought about when they put together the place setting and everything has a reason. In restaurants in the US, you often encounter two forks on the left and one knife on the right. In that case, use the outermost fork on the left and the knife on the right to eat your star course and then request a new knife, whether it's a steak knife or a regular knife, for your main course. Three, now it's time to serve the food. Most informal dinners are family style, meaning there are bowls or platters where food is served from. For formal dinners, courses are usually plated, but we talk about the intricacies of that in our formal dining etiquette video here. With bowls and anything at a table, the cardinal rule is don't reach over anybody else and don't touch them. To start, pass the roll around the table from the left to the right. When you get the bowl, you hold it and you serve yourself, and then you pass it on to your neighbor on the right. Always use the serving utensils and never your silverware that's on your place setting. Of course, if the host or hostess have a different idea, go with what they do. If you'd like seconds later on, or if you want salt, simply ask for it and don't reach it unless it's right in front of you. If someone asks you for either salt or pepper, always pass them both things together. When you serve yourself, be reasonable. You can count how many people are at the table and everyone wants something. So don't pile it up on your plate. You never want to take more than your fair share and keep in mind there will likely be seconds. Always be open-minded about the food being served. Even if you think you don't like something, the host likely put a lot of effort into the meal and you should always at least try it. Just put a little bit on your plate and try. If you suffer from severe food allergies, you should tell the host before the dinner is cooked so that they can make the proper arrangements. Four, finally it's time to eat. You should only start eating when everyone else has been served and the host or hostess starts to take their fork and take the lead. It's considered very impolite and sometimes even rude to just dig in to your plate of food while the others are still empty handed. When it comes to eating with silver, there are basically two schools of thought. One is the American way and one is the continental way. With the American method, you hold the fork in your right hand and you eat that way. If you cut off something, you transfer the fork to your left hand and have the knife in your right hand. When you're on cutting, place the knife on top of the plate or on a knife rest if it's available and then you transfer your fork from the left to the right again and eat. Because it's back and forth, it's also known as the zigzag method. On the other hand, with the continental method, you hold the fork in the left hand and the knife in the right hand. That way there's no switching of back and forth. Both the American and the continental method are perfectly acceptable. Personally, I prefer the continental version simply because I don't have to switch back and forth and so I can focus more on the conversation rather than having to pay attention to my plate. Even within the continental school of thought, there are differences in how you put the food to your mouth. Basically, when you hold your fork, you hold it to the left hand more like a pencil. However, when you switch to cutting something, you turn the fork around about 180 degrees. For example, if you cut a piece of meat, you can leave the fork in a cutting position and move it right to your mouth. That way it's curved down. Or you can switch it up and bring the fork to your mouth with it facing up. Both styles are acceptable. When it comes to spoon, basically everything that is served in a bowl or a bullion cup is supposed to be eaten with a spoon. The key is to be comfortable with whatever method you use. It should always look effortless. Feel free to practice at home until it has really become a part of who you are so you never have to think about it twice. So the big question is what to do with your elbows. As a general rule, don't put your elbows on your table when you're eating because it's considered to be impolite. Instead, leave your wrists on the table when you're chewing or if you go with the American method, you can also keep your hand on your lap. Now in between courses or if you have a conversation after dinner, it's totally fine to have your elbows on the table. Just make sure that your body language is engaged and not slouching. When eating in company, pace is very important. The goal is to have a great flowing conversation and because of that, you should neither eat too slow nor too fast. Something that I sometimes struggle with is speed. I eat way too fast. So company really helps me to slow down and engage in conversation. That way I can enjoy the food and a company at the same time. A good indicator are always the people around you or your host or hostess, so you're neither too fast or too slow. As a general rule, 
cut up the pieces of food as you eat them. Don't cut up everything before and then eat it piece by piece. That's only something you would do for a little child, not for a grown person. Also, take small bites and chew them and swallow them completely before you take the next bite. Always eat with your mouth closed and avoid making any chewing noises. Years ago, I used to eat a lot more salt than I do now, and so I always made assumptions about the food and heavily salted it before I tried it. Don't be that guy. Why? If a hiring manager sees that you salt your food before you try it, they'll let you believe that you make assumptions rather than make decisions based on fact, and they're less likely to give you the job. Even in a personal setting, it can be disrespectful to just salt your food without having tried it in the first place. Of course, if you've tried a food and it's under seasoned to your taste, ask for salt and pepper, and it should be better. Now is also a great time to compliment the host or hostess on their table arrangements, their food, maybe the choice of their wine, or something that you genuinely like. Make sure you're sincere, because otherwise people will notice. If someone asks you a question while you're still chewing, finish chewing and then answer. Likewise, don't ask others questions while they're still chewing because it may put them in the awkward situation where they still have to chew for 10-15 seconds and that creates awkward pauses. If bread is served with dinner, it's likely served in a basket or in a bowl and you pass it around just like any other serving bowl, from the left to the right. If you get the bowl, you take a piece of bread, you put it on your plate and you pass it on or put it back in its spot. Most of the time, butter is served with bread. Put some butter on your plate with a butter knife that is clean. Never use a knife or a piece of silverware that has been used. Depending on the country you're in, eating bread can also be different. In the US, most people will butter their entire bread, then pick it up by hand and take a bite and put the bread back. In Germany, for example, that would be a faux pas. Instead, you would take a piece of bread, break it off by hand, put a little piece of butter from your plate onto the bread, eat it, and then continue later on with breaking the bread, buttering it, and then eating it. So if you travel abroad, be aware of the cultural differences and try to be cognizant of them and respect them. If you end up with excess food in your mouth, use a napkin on your lap to wipe it off right away. Make sure to always use just one side of the napkin and stick with it, otherwise you'll stain your clothes. If something gets stuck in your teeth, don't just sit there, use a toothpick, or try to wipe it off while other people are there. The worst thing you can do is hold up your hand and try to get rid of it using your finger and maybe make awkward noises. Instead, excuse yourself, go to the restroom, make yourself look presentable, maybe use a toothpick if one is available. For example, in Austria, you find toothpicks even at the finest restaurants versus in Germany, toothpicks are not something you'll commonly encounter on a table. If you need to use a toothpick, it's always safer not to do so in public or at the table. So, so how should you excuse yourself? If you must leave because you're expecting an urgent call or you have to go to the restroom, simply say, excuse myself, I'll be right back. Please don't explain why you have to leave or what the reason is or that you just had four beer earlier and that you really have to pee. That's just not an appropriate conversation at the time. So while getting up from your chair, fold your napkin and place it to the left on your plate or on the chair. No, it doesn't have to be folded like before, just make sure it looks neat. Also, push your chair back in. My wife always gets annoyed with me if I don't put my chair back. If you ever have to leave the table, make sure to keep it short and five minutes max, otherwise it's very rude and impolite to stay away for longer than that. Now all that being said, here are some things you should never do when eating. Never use your fingers to eat food at the plate or especially put your last bit of food onto the fork. Instead, use a knife. I see a lot of people making that mistake, but it's completely unnecessary because you have all of the utensils at your disposal. Likewise, never lick your fingers or your fork or your plate afterwards, even though it's really, really tasty. Do not use your fork to cut something up. I see it time and time again where people are too lazy to pick up their knife and then they just try to push down, but it just shows that you don't have proper table manners. Also, don't flatten your food. I distinctly remember my grandpa always kind of smashing down everything and flattening it out on his table because he wanted his food to cool down faster so he could eat faster. It's just a bad look and it creates a bad vibe. Now that we talked a lot about eating, what about drinking? As a rule of thumb, you should never drink unless your host has raised a glass to a toast or started drinking themselves. Typically, you toast with wine or champagne, maybe with beer, 
but definitely not with water or pop. If there is stemmed glass on the table, you should hold them by the stem. Don't let the host or other guests dictate of how much alcohol you drink. You know your limits and it's okay to say no thank you or to simply not continue drinking your glass even though it's still full or half full. Don't get wasted and keep your consumption moderate. You don't want to be the odd guy out who gets hammered when he's invited over for dinner because it will likely be the last invitation for you. Generally, you should not ask for more wine or beer. A good host will notice that your glass is empty and offer you more if they have more. Now, as I said before, the main goal of having dinner and company is to have a great conversation. And so your body language and how you converse are very important. It all starts with your voice. Moderate the volume of it so you don't scream because that can be very unpleasant. Let other people finish talking and ask interesting questions and then listen. If you behave well and you're very entertaining, you may even end up with a compliment. If you want to learn how to accept one in a graceful way, please check out this video here. At the end of the meal, just fold your napkin and place it next to your plate. Never put it on the plate. Now, most people will never call out bad table manners in person. However, they will reflect poorly on you and you may not be invited back or your invitations may be rebuffed. Now that you're equipped with this table etiquette knowledge, you probably know more than the average person out there. However, that doesn't mean that you should chastise others about their table manners or even worse, criticize the host or tell them what to do, especially in a public setting because that's very embarrassing. Instead, always be kind, be generous, ask questions, listen, be a good sport, and smile. In today's video, I'm wearing two suit separates, the jacket of one, which is a brown and blue Prince of Wales check, and a blue pair of pants from another suit. Together, they work quite well. I'm combining them with another pair of brown Oxfords that are half brooks with a hand-finished patina. I tie everything together with a pair of brown and light blue socks from Fort Bevelier that pick up the color of the jacket and separate the shoes from the pants. My shirt is plain white with a classic collar and button barrel cuffs. My tie is made of English matter silk and the pattern ties together the solid of my shirt as well as the pattern of my jacket. It provides enough contrast and the pattern stands out from the background. The tie is from Fort Belvedere. I designed it and you can find it in our shop here, just like the pocket square, which is likewise from Fort Belvedere. I chose a burgundy color that picks up the blue and yellow tones of the tie and the jacket and the shoes, as well as the pants. And I chose a silk wool combination that ties together the flannel material of the jacket with the shinier silk texture of the tie. On my right ring finger, I'm wearing a gold ring with a dark star sapphire that changes the look in the light. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up and hit that little bell so more videos from our etiquette series come right to your inbox.